Hi, I'm Jonathan Lovett, the director of tonight's reading. Welcome to all of you, and thanks a lot for attending. I also wanted to thank Bruce, our talented playwright, for his script, our terrific performers for their time and talent, and our stage manager, Steve Walby, and Laura Black will be reading stage directions. Enjoy the show. The Honorary Consul by G. Bruce Smith, directed by Jonathan Levitt. Act One, Scene One, Late Afternoon, the home of Amanda Brooke and her three children, a Victorian in a San Francisco neighborhood that was once wealthy, but is now, in 1962, solidly middle class. The room we see is the living room. There is a sofa center stage and several armchairs and end tables. It is cluttered, filled with an odd assortment of knickknacks and wall hangings from throughout the world. African masks, Japanese prints, paintings of scenes in Europe. Also, many frame photographs, some showing a dark and handsome man dressed in formal attire, posing with world leaders, diplomats, etc. At rise, Elliot Brooke, 13, Amanda's youngest, enters from the front door foyer with his friend and schoolmate, Elizabeth Randall, also 13. Mother, I'm home. Mother? Maybe she's not home. Maybe you're right. Then we'll be all alone. Elliot, we have homework to do. This is a weird house. What's this? Elizabeth holds up a shriveled black thing with what looks like some straw attached to it. It's a baby shrunken head. We got it in Africa. Yuck! We got it from cannibals. Who's that in the picture? My father. Who's he with? The Emperor of Ethiopia. Abyssinia, the ancient name of Ethiopia. Very good. You're as smart as you are sexy. Don't even think about it. What? Touching my breast. I doubt I'll even let you kiss me. We'll see. Suddenly, there's a scream off stage from Brigitta, and we see Zane Brooks, 17, Amanda's oldest, running from the upstairs exit to the kitchen exit. He is wearing a football helmet, pants, and no shirt, but a bra. We hear off stage Brigitte Brooke, 15, Amanda's middle child. Ah! Mother! Zane stole my bra again! Who's that? My sister. No, the guy who went to the living room wearing a brassiere. Oh, well that's my brother Zane. He plays football at school. With a bra? Nah, he just wears that at home sometimes. Oh, uh, you want a bula bula? What's a bula bula? It's an Egyptian mummy candy. It's considered a delicacy along the Nile. You're full of shit. But I'm cute. Zane, give the bra back to your sister. Why does your brother wear bras? Is he? Nah. He's practicing for a poetry recital. Okay. What? When lilacs last in the dooryard bloomed. Walt Whitman. Are you sure he isn't? No, he just does better when he practices wearing a brassiere. Mother! I'm home! Uh, bonjour, mon petit darling. We hear a scream off stage from the kitchen. It is Josephine, the living cook. Ah! Mrs. Brooke, what do you expect me to do with that? I expect you to cook it. Who was that? Josephine. She's... Sort of our cook. How can she be sort of a cook? She cooks sometimes, but m my mother actually hired her because she can play cribbage. Going back to your brother... He likes to play football and recite poetry. What kind of a name is Zane, anyway? My mother was in her western phase. She was reading Zane Grey novels when she was pregnant with my brother. When she had my sister, Birgitta, she was in her Ibsen phase. Zane enters, still wearing the bra. He is holding a carton of ice cream and eating from it. Oh, hey, Mother! Elliot brought home a sweet young thing for dinner. Zane? Yeah, didn't Elliot tell you? About the cannibals? Zane, shut up! See, our dad took us to this cannibal village once, and man, we had the best meal ever. Zane! Ever since then, we just gotta have that human meat. Elliot likes best in a pie, you know, like chicken pot pie, but give me a barbecue any day. 
Get out of here! Oh, I'm scared. Mother, tell Zane to bring me my bra. I've got to get ready for the dance tonight. Mrs. Brooke, I can't cut this thing up. Well, you can't expect me to do it. Amanda enters quietly behind Zane, sneaks up on him, and snaps the back of the bra. <laughs> <laughs> now, you take that thing up to your sister immediately. Oh, oh. and who is this precious young thing? You are delicious. Mother! <laughs> oh, I'm only joking, my little pretty. Oh, <sighs> Mother? This is Elizabeth. She's in my classes at Le Lycée Francais. Oh, enchantée, ma petite sweetheart. Vous parlez français? Mais oui, 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 yes. Um, now then, back to the kitchen. Who shall we have for dinner? I, I mean, what shall we have for dinner? <laughs> I'm sorry. That's okay. You don't really eat. People? No. Only at Thanksgiving. <laughs> Funny. Does your mother speak French? No, but she kind of pretends she does. It's because of her job and everything. What does she do? She's an honorary consul. What's that? It's an American who represents another country. Kind of like an ambassador, but outside the capital city and not a citizen of that country. Oh. She's the honorary consul for Upper Volta here in San Francisco. Not quite sure what, if anything, she actually does for Upper Volta. Upper Volta, a small landlocked country in West Africa. It became a French colony in 1896, and it became independent in 1960. The president is Maurice Yamiogo. Wow. How'd you know all that? I had to do a term paper on three African countries for my geography class last year. Besides... I'm intelligent. And sexy. How did your mother get to be the honorary consul? I'm not sure. Somehow through my dad. We lived in Africa when I was a kid because my dad was in the diplomatic corps. Worked for a couple different ambassadors. Don't really remember much because my dad died when I was eight years old. Do you remember your father? Yes, I do. It's kind of hard to lose. Oh, they're so young. Must have been difficult. I used to cry myself to sleep every night. Poor thing. Elliot slowly eases his hand towards Elizabeth's breast. But I took the comfort in the milk of some human kindness. You pig! <laughs> oh, come on. One feel. You're a cruel ghoul. That's why I like you. I'm leaving. No, stay. I'll be good, I promise. Yes, my little sweetie, you should stay for dinner. We're having Malaysian turtle in peanut sauce. Josephine's making a fuss about cutting up the turtle. Brigitte enters wearing a poodle skirt and the now famous bra with her hair in rollers. Mother, can you help me with my hair? Brigitte, darling, you look charming, but nobody wears poodle skirts anymore. I should have taken you to see breakfast at Tiffany's. I'm not wearing the poodle skirt tonight. I just put it on for now to ask you to help me with my hair. Hmm. Who are you? This is Elizabeth. Your brother's trying to get into her pants. Mother! Ah! Josephine! Oh. It's gone! What is gone? The turtle! It ran away! Josephine, the turtle is dead. It can't run away. Will you help me find it, Mrs. Brooke? Ugh. Mother, you didn't help me with my hair. Zane enters, holding a book, but reciting his lines mostly from memory. And lilacs last in the dooryard bloomed, and the great star early drooped in the western sky in the night. I hate poetry. Maybe I should leave. No! She's gone. I followed her into the kitchen. She ran out the back door saying, Here, turtle, turtle, where are you, little turtle? Oh. Did she find it? No, she didn't, but I did in the refrigerator. Josephine really does get muddled sometimes. 
Well, she did it on purpose, Mother, so she wouldn't have to chop the thing and cook it. No, I don't think so. Anyway, you'll have to do it now, Zane. Mother, I'm practicing for the recital. Oh, don't worry, you'll win again. Just cut it into nice little bite-sized pieces. Mother, my hair. Yes, all right, darling, come sit here. Elizabeth, you seem like a charming girl, très charmante. <laughs> And I'll bet you come from a nice, fine San Francisco family, don't you, Elizabeth? I really should be going. We can have her read Shakespeare with us tonight. She'd be a delightful Hermia. Oh, not Midsummer Night's Dream again. I wanted Julius Caesar. Ed to Brute? Why can't we be like a normal family and watch television at night? Darling, television is for the unwashed masses. If reading plays was good enough for Eleanor Roosevelt and her children, then it's good enough for us. From the kitchen, we hear the sounds of a butcher's knife whacking down onto a cutting board. Ever returning spring, <laughs> Trinity sure to me you bring. I have to get home. Oh no, you must stay. Lilac blooming perennial <laughs> and drooping star in the west. Elizabeth, what does your father do? He's a banker. Of course. He owns Geary Bank. Amanda yanks hard on Brigitte's hair. Ouch! And, um, you live in Pacific Heights? Knob Hill. Another hard yank. Mother! <laughs> um, Elliot told you what I do. He explained it to me. Mm -hmm. There are more than 50 countries represented here in San Francisco. The consular corps is very tight-knit, and of course, we throw the most fabulous parties. <laughs> My friends come from the elite, la creme de la creme of their respective nations. <laughs> Not a banker among them. Suddenly, we hear the voice of Josephine from the foyer exit. Come in, come in, me here, Caron. Wow, you're looking as handsome as a gentleman mounted on a ripe young filly with long, long legs and a lustrous mane. Gregoire, do come in, darling. Gregoire Caron, the French consul slash cultural attaché, enters with Josephine. He is tall and suave, something of a dilettante. Oh, announcing Monsieur Caron, the French Consul. Yes, Josephine, I know who he is. Amanda, you look ravishing. <laughs> Nonsense. I look old and tired. I think you are more beautiful than a Renoir painting. Oh, well, I think you're full of shit. Orgita, suddenly realizing she is wearing a bra and no skirt, jumps up and runs screaming from the room and exits up the stairs. Monsieur Caron, a cultured man like you must remember that it wasn't long ago that shapely, buxom women were considered the epitome of beauty, just like your Renoir paintings. Well, most of Renoir's paintings were not of, shall we say, a large women. How did you get in through the front door, Josephine? I was chasing the turtle. It had climbed up the back stairs of Mr. Smith's house, trailing some horrible wet ewes, and then slid down the banister just out of my reach. Why, then that horrible green scaly thing just skidded its way along the sidewalk and then disappeared. And then I saw Mr. Caron, and well, I just had to give him a right proper welcome. <laughs> Elizabeth and I are going to go upstairs and do our homework. I don't know. Elliot takes Elizabeth's elbow to ease her off stage, but Elizabeth resists. Josephine, go help Zane in the kitchen. I'd be pleased to make me share Caron Ambrosia, the food of the gods. 
I don't remember her speaking with a southern accent. Excuse us, we have to go upstairs and study? Just keep your greasy paws to yourself. Amanda, Amanda, you must come with me tomorrow to the reception. I don't know. Monsieur Martin mentioned something about escorting me. The Belgian? How can you even contemplate being seen with anyone from that dull country? Uh, Belgium's great contribution to culture is the waffle. <laughs> I think he's charming in a chubby, balding sort of way. Besides, what have you done lately for our enlightenment? You are France's consul and cultural attaché, after all. I am planning a Truffaut film festival in San Francisco with the master filmmaker himself speaking at the Palace of Fine Arts. You've been working on that for years. I don't believe you. <laughs> you get lovelier than ever when you have the fire in your eyes. Oh, I am thinking, thinking your lustrous air will burst into flames. Let me kiss it, Amanda. Let me bury myself in the passion of your air. Oh, <laughs> oh shades of night. Oh, moody, tearful night. Oh, woe is me. Look at this butchery. Uh, Gregoire, why have you come to visit? I just heard the news. Why didn't you tell me? Tell you what? Oh, so now you are being, uh, how do you say, coy? Petite moi, coy? Why didn't you tell me that, that President Yamayogo is coming to San Francisco? Your son's disgusting, filthy, I say. Elliot tried again to touch my... One of those monsters put a dead mouse in my bra. Uh oh he put a piece of turtle meat down the back of my blouse. I'm leaving. I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything. Oh. Yes, yes Elliot tried, tried again to touch my... my blouse. Oh, I'm leaving. I'm leaving. Uh, leaving. Elizabeth tries to leave, but Elliot restrains her. Amanda pulls Gregoire to a corner of the stage. What did you say? President Yamayogo, Amanda. He will be here in just two days. The radio said he will meet with President Kennedy in Washington and then come here to San Francisco. Surely you knew. Gregoire, I... Uh... When will you be having the reception for him? Hmm? Amanda reels slightly as she begins to faint, falling toward Gregoire. Gregoire, distracted, turns just as Amanda faints and crashes to the floor. Lights out. Blackout. End of Act One, Scene One. Act One, Scene Two. That evening. At rise, Amanda is pacing. Zane enters quietly from upstairs. So, Mother, what are you going to do? I don't like pimply teenagers who sneak around the house. Come on, tell me. How are you going to get yourself out of this one? I don't know what you're talking about. They're going to catch you this time. You know, for a, a young man who I think is actually quite intelligent, you do say some stupid things. You might be able to fool Brigitte, even Elliot, even the entire Consul Corps, but not me. I have to think. Upper Volta seemed like a good choice, didn't it? Probably one of the poorest countries in Africa, lots of political instability, not a chance the, that the president would ever leave the country. He'd be too scared he'd be overthrown. How long have you known? Let's see. You've been, quote, honorary consul since Upper Volta's independence two years ago? I've known for two years. Don't tell your brother or sister. I think everyone's gonna find out pretty soon whether I say anything or not. You have to help me, Zane. Why should I? I have to, pre I have to reach President Yamayogo somehow. And tell him that you've pretended to be his honorary consul? I have to think. 
I'm going upstairs to my room to listen to the radio. If I get any calls, take a message. Amanda exits. Zane crosses to the record player and puts on a 45. We hear Chubby Checker singing, Let's Twist Again. Absent-mindedly, Zane picks up one of his mother's pink hats, <laughs> puts it on his head and starts to twist. Brigitte enters. This time, she's wearing a blouse and pedal pushers. Her face is covered in white cold cream. Don't you look pretty? <laughs> You're a joke. You don't mind traipsing around in my bras, but you're embarrassed to be seen in one of Mother's hats. Get lost. Where's Mother? In a room. She's probably catching spiders and burning them with her cigarette. I've never seen you dance before. The football coach told us the twist is a good exercise. Hmm. You're full of it. I told you. Get lost. Can you help me with my hair? Mother said you'd be able to put it in a nice French twist. Bullshit. I wish Dad was here. He'd brush, his hair, brush my hair for me. Why is Mother so mean to me? Amanda is mean to all of us. I hate it when you call her Amanda. Because she's so motherly? She spoils Elliot and she admires you. Huh. She admires me. That's a good one. She does. You're a fighter like she is. Yeah, we fight all right. And Elliot's brilliant, like Dad was, which leaves me stuck between the two boys like a sore thumb. Not very much of a fighter and certainly not very smart. You're right. You're not very smart when you talk like this. Will you help me with my homework this weekend? No. Just math. I'd ask Elliot, but it's too humiliating to be helped by a 13-year-old brat. I said no. I think Jimmy will be a great father. Jimmy? My date tonight. We're going to the school dance. He's dreamy. The kid with the pizza face? We're practically engaged to be married. He says he wants four children, two boys and two girls, and he wants his wife to be a good housewife. And I will be a good housewife. I won't go out every night to parties to get away from my children. You're too young to be talking about marriage. You're not my father. Well, somebody's got to watch what a stupid girl like you does. If I didn't know any better, I'd say you actually care about me. Oh, you obviously don't know better. Sometimes you're so sweet, I want to give you my entire Brazier collection. Oh. Buzz off. I'm going to give you a kiss, my dear brother. You better not. Mwah! <laughs> A big piece on his cheek, smearing cold cream all over his face. Zane yells and runs after a gleeful Birgitta. They exit upstairs. Zane, come here. Zane! Zane enters, wiping cold cream off his face. Wherever have you been? Chasing Birgitta. Oh, it's a waste of time. I've decided what I must do. Flee to Alaska? You are impertinent. No, I have to call President Yamayogo. And tell him what? That one of his ministers appointed me honorary consul, and he never knew. Like that will work. <laughs> oh, you're so dreadfully dismal, Zane. I should have named you Rasputin. Do you really think you'll convince the president? Of course. You know how charming I am. To everyone but your children. I'm sorry, what's that? Nothing. Really, Zane, you are quite vexing. Could I go to my bedroom now? No. He crosses to telephone and pushes the receiver several times. Hello, operator. I want to make a call to Upper Volta. No, I did not just call you revolting. I said Upper Volta. It's in Africa, for God's sake. Where are you from, Nebraska? I want to reach President Yamayogo. No, not President Kennedy. Does Yamayogo sound anything like Kennedy? What do you mean you don't have a number for the president? He's, he's the president, for heaven's sake. Wait, hang on. 
Zane, darling, can you please explain to this country bumpkin operator who it is that I'm trying to reach? <clears throat> Hello? What's your name? Sally. That's a sexy name. Are you blonde? Yes? I like blondes. Do you like football players that recite poetry? What? No, my mother isn't crazy. Well, maybe sort of. What's that? Yes. I'll tell her you're not from Nebraska. Oh, I see. You're from Kansas. Well, that makes all the difference. <laughs> Dane, come. <clears throat> Sally, can you manage to reach President Yamiogo in Upper Volta? Yes, of, of course. You figure it out and give us a call back at Emerson 23456. Uh, by the way, uh, what are you wearing? <laughs> what do you think she's wearing at work, dear? A see-through nighty? Hello? Hello? Sally? She hung up. I can't imagine why. Why are you doing this? Why do you think? You're such a smart boy. Well, a stupid smart boy. How can someone be stupid and smart at the same time? How, indeed. Mother. Look, you know very well what my childhood was like. Yes, your father was a drunk. And my mother was... Stoic. Distant. I had a very difficult... Childhood. And when I met your father... That was your ticket out of poverty. I loved your father. I know. You have no idea what it's like to be poor. Don't diminish my suffering, Zane. And you have no idea how much- How much you deserve the good life. Not the good life, a good life. And how you love going to parties. Mm -hmm. Wearing fashionable- Pink hats. Oh, you do understand. <laughs> I've seen you wearing my pink hats. You have not. Darling, I don't care if you like wearing my pink hats. Zane, dear, I don't care if you are a homosexual. I'm not! Oh, of course you're not. Oh. Well, perhaps... Mother! You're right. Yes, I suppose you're right. After all, a homosexual wouldn't ask what Sally was wearing. Exactly. Anyway... Do you think that she will try and reach President Yamayogo? She sounded quite charming on the phone. I have no doubt. Well, dear, she is from Kansas. Kansas is, is a perfectly good state. Is it? Do you know exactly where it is? Because I have no idea. Mother, I'm going to bed. Darling, you must know. I just want the best for you. And for Brigitte and Elliot. I know. And the best parties and status and... When I was growing up, I invented a life where my father spoiled me and my mother tucked me into bed and kissed me and hugged me as she told me sweet stories so that I would fall asleep dreaming of... Dreaming of... Dreaming of... Happy things, a happy life. Go to bed, Zane. Good night, mother. Brigitte enters. She is dressed to go out to the school dance. Mother, what do you think? You look, you look nice, dear. Nice? I think I look quite pretty. Hmm, yes. Um, why are you all dressed up? I'm going to the school dance with Jimmy. He's dreamy. Have a good time. I think he might try to get to second base with me. That's nice. Mother, aren't you shocked that he might try to get to second base with me? Well, you have rather nice breasts for a 15-year-old. I can hardly blame him for trying. Well... Should I let him 
feel mine. You know? That's your decision, dear. Mother! You're no help at all. That's probably true. You seem... distracted. Um, mm hmm? What? Why can't you confide in me the way you do with Zane? All right, then. I need to reach President Yamayogo. I don't think you can help me with that. Why do you need to reach him? To tell him you're a fake honorary consul? I am not fake! My goodness. Perhaps you're not as slow as I thought you were. I was suspected for a long time that you just wanted to be an honorary consul to be able to go to parties and have some place in society. I mean, I've never seen you actually do anything that seems related to Upper Volta. I did it for you children. Of course, because you need the fake money to support us. Your father left us this house and some money, but not enough. Mother, you don't get any money for your fake position. Well, that might be true, but I save lots of money by getting free drinks at the parties rather than buying champagne for home consumption. Maybe I can help you. Brigitte, dear. Obviously, I know that President Yamayogo is coming to San Francisco and that you're expected to have a party for him. I'll figure out something to help you. You are a dear. I mean it! I'll show you that I'm more than a pretty girl with nice breasts. Knock on front door. <gasps> that must be Jimmy! He runs to the front door off stage. Oh, have fun, Brigitte. Oh, and if second base isn't enough, Go to third base. I think you'll find that quite satisfying. <laughs> Mother! Oh, but don't let him get a home run. Home runs are really quite overrated. We hear the front door slam shut. Lights fade. Blackout. End of Act 1, Scene 2. Act 1, Scene 3, next morning. At rise, Amanda crosses to the phone and jiggles the receiver. Hello? Yes, is Sally there? Sally from Kansas. My son tells me she's charming. Well, she's apparently blonde, though I imagine she dyes her hair. Very few women are natural blondes. What do you mean you don't know Sally? How many Sally operators can there be? Oh, well, yes, perhaps you can help me. Sally was supposed to call us back when she reached President Yemiogo of Upper Volta. Oh, dear God, are you also from Kansas? Upper Volta is an African country. Well, please reach President Yamayogo and call me back at Emerson 23456. Oh, this family has ruined my life! Don't be so dramatic, Elliot. It's unseemly. Oh, yeah? Well, if we were a normal family, I'm sure Elizabeth would have let me... Elliot, dear, you're just 13. Wait until you're 14. By the way, I've decided you should go to Yale. Must be he was Harvard. You won't look good. You won't look good in Harvard colors. But mother, I'm God only knows I can't. Yes, God knows I can't count on your brother. He's more interested in football and cross dressing than he is in his studies. I'll probably never see her again. Who? Who else? Elizabeth. Oh, darling, you can do so much better than a banker's daughter. <clears throat> He's not just a banker. He owns one of the biggest banks in San Francisco. Bankers are so dreadfully dull. Oh, I can't cook today. The turtle episode has made me sick to my stomach. But I can play cribbage with you later, after I've had a rest. The trauma must have been terrible. Oh, it was. And Zane is a pervert. A knock on the front door. Please answer that, Josephine. Oh, why, Monsieur Caron, please come in. Why is she doing that stupid southern accent? <gasps> My lovely Amanda! <laughs> Gregoire, how good it is to see you! 
Zane enters wearing nothing but pajama bottoms. Josephine, please bring me some coffee. After what you did to me yesterday. <laughs> Amanda, my dear, may I speak to you in private? Not now. I'm waiting for a very important telephone call. From Sally? I think I'm in love with her. <laughs> I doubt she's a real blonde Zane. Who's Sally? Birgitta enters looking a bit mussed up. Ah, Birgitta. How did your baseball game go? Baseball? You know, first base, second base. Hopefully third base. Mother. Timmy was a total gentleman. What a pity. Is it too much to ask for a feel of a banker's daughter's lovely... At your age, yes. I told you, give it a year. Telephone rings. Zane, answer it. You think it's Sally? I think I'll ask her to marry me. <laughs> Hello? Yes, yes, this is Emerson 23456. Is this President Yamiago? Hello? Hello? I, I can't hear you. Give but me the phone. Give it to me. Your Majesty, uh, President Yamiago. He's not a king. Hello? Hello? Mr. President, I, I can't understand what you're saying. Amanda, I must talk to you privately. I think I will die if I can't marry Sally. I'm thinking of marrying Jimmy, or his brother. He's quite handsome and he doesn't have acne. Amanda, Amanda, I need to. Elizabeth, Elizabeth, wherefore art thou Elizabeth? That's Juliet's line, you idiot. For Romeo, not Elizabeth. Oh dear God, I can't hear a word he's saying. Zane, take the telephone and tell me what that upper Volton is trying to tell me. Hello? Is Sally there? Zane! Connection is dead. Everybody out. I need to think. Alone. Gregoire, go, please. No. Not until I have said what I need to say. I can no longer hide my love, my adoration for you. Gregoire gets down on one knee pulls a small box from his pocket and opens it for Amanda to see. She pulls a diamond ring from the box. This diamond is rather small. As a matter of fact, I can barely see it. Forgive me, Amanda. Uh, the size of the diamond does not represent the entire universe of love that I feel in my art for you. I should hope not. <sighs> Marry me. Please. Oh, dearest Gregoire, you know that I'm very fond of you. Fond? Fond? Oh, what a terrible word. The French are not fond, they are passionate. Yes, yes you are, but you see... Oh, you have stuck a dagger into my art. I loved my husband very much, and... But, but, but he has been uh, 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 not of this world for five years. Yes, that's true, but I don't think I'm ready. Oh, my heart is bleeding into my soul, and my soul is red with blood. Are you quite serious? Very. Perhaps... Perhaps I shall throw myself off the Golden Gate Bridge. Hmm? I seriously doubt it. Uh, you have no idea how struck with grief I am. Gregoire, you have been a confirmed bachelor for all these years. You don't want to be a stepfather to the three challenging children that I have. Zane will go to university soon, and we will send the other two horrible children to boarding school. I didn't say horrible. Challenging, horrible, what is the difference? You may have a point. But Gregoire, Shelley, as I said, I don't think that I'm ready. All I know 
is that I want. No, 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 no. I need to make love to you. Oh, and marry you, of course. Mm. You just want to have sex with me. This is probably true, yeah. Uh, but I am willing to marry you just so I could get into you into the bed with me. No? Are you not impressed with the sacrifice I am willing to make? Eh? Dearest Gregoire, go home. If they find me dead, floating on the cold waters of the San Francisco Bay, you will make sure that I have the very best of funeral with all the consular corps weeping at the tragedy. You must give a very moving, very tragic eulogy for me. Hmm? Yes, I will now go. Farewell, my lovely. If you are truly fond of me, you will throw yourself on my casket. <laughs> Did he actually ask you to marry him? Were you listening to our private conversation? You know, he only wants to have sex with you. Yes, I surmised as much. You should think about it, Mother. Think about having sex with him or think about marrying him? Both. Then you won't have to keep on this charade of being honorary consul. I need to continue to take care of you children. Properly. Mother. By myself. You lost your maternal instinct when you left the womb. That is very hurtful, Zane. Sorry, but you've been alone for five years now. Dad was terrific, but it's time to accept another man who will, might, love you. You heard him, Zane. He wants to send Brigitte and Elliot to boarding school. It might do them some good. No, I can't do that. I must suffer as a widow. Knock on front door. Brigitta enters down staircase running. Oh, I'll answer it. Jimmy! Oh, Jimmy, thank you. You're the best. Mother, look what Jimmy gave me. His class ring, he asked me to go study with him. Zane, do you hear a steady drip? <laughs> You're both horrid. Brigitte, dear, I am happy for you. When do I get to meet this Timmy boy of yours? It's Jimmy. I've met him. I heard his nickname is Pepperoni because he has a pizza face. <laughs> horrid and cruel. <clears throat> <clears throat> I have a plan. A plan? President Yamiyoko is scheduled to arrive in San Francisco the day after tomorrow. So you should go ahead and plan a reception here for him the following evening. Brilliant. The consular corps shows up, but the president doesn't. So what? You announce at the party that he's become ill. He sends his regrets, etc. The press will report on his whereabouts. Well, that's a chance we can take. He arrives in the late afternoon. He'll likely go to his hotel, and I doubt he will have any obligations other than have dinner and go to bed. I don't think the press will follow him from the airport to his hotel. I doubt they'll even report on his activities the day after that. That might work. You know, I think I like the smart side of you rather than the stupid teenager you usually are. Yes, I have to say I've come up with a good plan. But I think you should come clean. Whatever do you mean? I think after the party, you should tell your friends in the consul corps you are not the honorary consul for Upper Volta. Impossible. Mm -mm. The deception has gone on long enough. And to be honest. What? Sometimes none of us can tell when you are being real and when you are being fake. None of us, who are you referring to? Me, Brigitta, Elliot. Nonsense. It's not. We all wonder whether you really love us or 
more interested in trying to get respect for what you do. Don't be ridiculous. I have raised you on my own ever since your father died. You're out almost every night. You show very little interest in our school activities or even anything about us. And we only get time with you when you play cribbage with us. We read Shakespeare as a family once a week. Maybe if you're no longer an honorary consul, we'll finally get more of your time. Everything I have done has been for you children. Really? You have no idea what it's been like for me. You have no idea what it's been like for us! Lights fade. Blackout. End of Act 1, Scene 3. Act 1, Scene 4. Two days later. At Rise, Amanda is on the telephone. Oui, oui. Monsieur Martin, President Yameogo has arrived and went straight to his hotel. Yes, that's right. The reception is at 8 o'clock tomorrow. You received the invitation, did you not? Good, good. No, I don't think it's a good idea for you to go to his hotel and meet with him. I mean, for heaven's sake, Upper Volta was a French colony, not Belgian. Yes, perhaps the French did steal it from you, but you had the Congo, which is much larger than Upper Volta. Regardless, President Yameogo has made it clear to me he wants to enjoy San Francisco on his own. Zane enters, wearing the kind of hat Walt, Woodman, Walt Whitman would wear. He is also holding a copy of Whitman's When Lilacs Last and the Dooryard Bloomed. The president told me he was smitten when he heard Tony Bennett sing, I Left My Heart in San Francisco. Oh, dear God. He's rather taken with Andy Warhol as well, though, honestly, I find pop art trivial and superficial. And superfluous and redundant. Oh, he goes wild over Hitchcock films. Yes, I'm sure he'd be delighted to hear your theories on Alfred Hitchcock. <laughs> A demain, chérie. You just can't help lying, can you? The stuff about Tony Bennett and Andy Warhol. They're and details. They're not lies. Details make the story authentic and my relationship with President Yamiogo real. I give up. Besides, it was important for me to establish that President Yamiogo wants to be left alone, except, of course, for the reception. Which the president doesn't know about. Monsieur Martin is the biggest gossip in the consular court, so he will spread the news that the president is not to be disturbed before the reception. You're crafty as a fox. <laughs> Are you wearing one of your father's hats? I found this in the attic. It's the closest thing I could find that, that looks like a hat Walt Whitman would wear. <laughs> when lilacs last and the dooryard bloomed. Why aren't you wearing a bra? Knock on the front door. Oh, I'll get it. Elliot goes to the foyer front door. Elizabeth, come in. Telephone rings. Amanda crosses and picks up the receiver. Basil, darling, how are you? I have to talk to you. I need to warn you. And the great star. Shoot, what's the line? You look beautiful. Yes, Basil, I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. President Yamiogo is a dictator. Your mother must stop being honorary consul to this bad man. Yes, the president is quite charming. His people adore him. But really, I've come here to warn you that... Great star, early drooped in the western sky in the night. My brother is coming here to... Loud knock on the front door. Josephine enters from the kitchen, making her way to the foyer front door. I'll answer the door. Ooh, perhaps it's Monsieur Caron. Jimmy bursts in, Josephine following behind him. Where is he? I'll kill him. Run, Elliot! There you are, you disgusting 13-year-old, trying to feel up my sister's private parts. Elliot runs up the staircase, Jimmy in hot pursuit. They exit. Oh, shades of night. Oh, moody, tearful night. Goodbye, Basil. Amanda sees Elizabeth. Oh, bonjour, Elizabeth. 
What's the next line? Zane checks the text in his book. Ah! Jimmy, what are you doing here? Elliot enters, running down the staircase, followed by Jimmy, followed by Birgitta. Elliot exits to kitchen. Birgitta catches up with Jimmy and holds him back. Jimmy, why are you chasing my brother? Your brother tried to feel up my sister's, you know. Your sister? That's me. Oh, I didn't know she was your sister. Oh, Jimmy. I'm breaking up with you, and I want my ring back. Zane, you're right. He has terrible acne. No, Jimmy, please. I hate Elliot as much as you do. I'll break your brother's neck. Wait, Jimmy! Jimmy exits the kitchen with Brigitte running behind him. Oh, great star disappeared. Sorry, I didn't think my brother would want to kill Elliot. And after thinking it over, I think I'd like Elliot to touch my breasts, but over my dress. Sensible girl. Mrs. Brooke. I'm exhausted. I need to take a nap. Josephine, you have lots of work to do before the reception tomorrow. Now go. Telephone rings. Amanda answers it. Monsieur Caron. Yes, tomorrow evening. I'm so happy you intend to come. No, Gregoire, I will not marry you. You just want to have sex with me. Elliot enters from the foyer front door. Oh, where is he? Who, darling? The maniac was trying to kill me! You are dramatic, Elliot. My brother Jimmy is trying to kill him. Oh, is he the one with the pizza face? A quick, hide in the closet! Oh, the black murk that hides the star. Elliot hides in the closet. Jimmy enters from the foyer front door, followed closely by Brigitte. Where is he? Who, dear? Edward. It's Elliot, you idiot. I'm afraid I don't know any Elliot, or Edward for that matter. Brigitte throws herself on the floor, grabbing Jimmy's leg. Jimmy, you are my one and only. I can't live without you. Let go of me. Oh, cruel hands that hold me powerless. Cad, are you hiding in the closet? Jimmy makes his way to the closet, dragging Brigitte behind him. He throws open the door. Elliot emerges and kicks Jimmy on the shin in the leg that Brigitte is not holding on to. Ow! Elliot runs to the foyer front door and exits. Let him go! I promise you, I will poison my brother tonight. Just tell me, Jimmy, that you will love me forever! The phone rings. Amanda answers it. Herr Schmidt, guten Tag. How can I practice with all this commotion? Mother, hang up. And get Sally on the phone. I want to recite to her. Let go of me. Yes, Herr Schmidt, it's true. Just like you, he adores Hitchcock movies. Jimmy breaks loose from Brigitte and exits through foyer front door. Brigitte Yay! falls. Auf Wiedersehen, Herr Schmidt. If my brother doesn't kill Elliot, be sure to tell him that I've changed my mind and he can feel my breasts over my dress. I shall indeed pass your message on to him. I'm sure he'll be very pleased. <laughs> Though I did tell him to wait a year before making such a bold move. Oh, helpless soul of me. No, he doesn't have to wait that long. Au revoir, Madame Brooke. <sighs> Everyone from the consular corps is coming tomorrow. It's going to be quite festive. Elliot comes running in from the kitchen, followed closely by Jimmy and Brigitte. Jimmy tackles Elliot, who falls to the floor, and Brigitte lands on top of Jimmy. <laughs> she tries to hold him back. The three of them struggle. Loud knock on front door. Josephine runs to answer it. President Yamiogo enters. Mrs. Brooke, how dare you? Yamiogo, not seeing the pile created by Elliot, Jimmy, and Brigitte, steps forward and trips over them. He is knocked unconscious. Jimmy, Elliot, and Brigitte look up in surprise. They extricate themselves from the pile and peer down at Yamiogo. Well, Timmy, 
It seems you've managed to kill the president of Upper Volta. Holy cow. Jimmy, panicked, flees from the stage and exits through foyer front door. Lights out, blackout, end of act one. Oh, harsh surrounding cloud that will not free my soul. Act two, scene one, a short time later, Yamiogo, still unconscious, is tied to a chair with a kerchief over his mouth. Amanda, Zane, Brigitte, Elliot, and Josephine are all gathered together in the living room. Brigitte is weeping. I hate you, Elliot. I wish Jimmy had killed you. Really, Brigitte? Timmy has such terrible acne, you can't possibly be interested in him. It's Jimmy! How many times do I have to tell you? <laughs> Mother, I can't believe you've lied all this time. Elliot, I can't believe you're surprised. Mother is hateful. She's a liar and she doesn't care about us. She'd rather go to those stupid parties and be a real mother. That is not true. We never see you. By the time we get home from school, you're ready to go out to that night's party. We usually have dinner alone with Josephine. Mm, there's some truth to that, Mrs. Brooke. You're all ganging up on me. Listen, it's not easy to be a widow with three heart challenging children. I'll never see Elizabeth again. Particularly when she finds out my mother is a liar. Not true. She told me that she would be delighted if you would feel her up as long as it's over her dress. Really? Cool. Ahem. We have bigger problems. We've essentially kidnapped the president and we're holding him captive. Elizabeth told me that Yamayago was a dictator. We need to take him to prison. Alcatraz. <gasps> Yamiogo stories. That's a splendid idea, Zane. Arrange for us to get a boat so that we can transport our prisoner to Alcatraz. Yamiogo stirs, wakes up, and struggles to get himself free. <laughs> our guest rises from the dead. President Yamiogo, it's a pleasure to welcome <laughs> you to our humble, humble home. Yamiogo continues to struggle. Elia crosses to Yamiogo. What do you got to say for yourself, Mr. Dictator? <laughs> Elliot removes the kerchief over Yamiogo's mouth. You will all pay dearly for this atrocity. I am President Maurice Yamiogo, Supreme Ruler of Upper Volta. Supreme idiot. Yes, Your Majesty. And we have no intention of keeping you captive. But, well, there's just one small complication that I'm sure you can address, and then we can all live happily ever after. We're taking you to Alcatraz where you spend the rest of your life. That's one option. <sighs> wow, that's ooh, crazy! The the other option is far more tasteful for all of us. Just come to my cocktail reception tomorrow evening and pretend that I am your honorary consul. I promise the gathering will be most festive and you will be the center of attention. You will all go to prison for this. Zane Elliot, please muzzle our rather rude guest and take him to the kitchen. You should all be executed for crimes against the Yamiogo's mouth, and he and Zane lift the chair and carry the president to the kitchen exit, with Yamiogo wiggling and protesting in muffled words the whole way. Zane and Elliot enter. What now, mother dear? I need to think. Alone. Leave me. Mother, you have to help me get Jimmy back. I told you all to leave. You owe it to me. Why, it's not my fault Jimmy broke up with you, it's Elliot's. Well, obviously he can't do anything about it. Oh dear. I'm frightened. What? Your brothers can't know. That you're... Yes, frightened. Wow. 
thank you for confiding in me. Dear boys, men, they're weak. Your brothers have always counted on me to be strong for them. But they are strong. After your father died, who came crying to my bed in the middle of the night? Zane? Elliot? Yes, but not you. Of course you were devastated by your father's death, but you're a girl. You're stronger than your brothers. I... I don't know what to say. I don't mind going to prison. I'm used to hardship. I've suffered a lot in this life. Well... But what will become of you children? There are no relatives to care for you. Mother, as I told you the other night, I want to help you. You're a dear. No, I mean it. First of all, we have to figure out how President Yamioba found out about you. Josephine, come here! Are you ready to take this man away from the kitchen and put him in prison? Josephine, you need to do something for us. I want you to ask the President how he found out about Mother's charade. Well, what if he doesn't want to tell me? Take one of your kitchen knives and put it up against his throat. Tell him he will slit if he refuses to talk. Brigitte, no, I don't think- I'll do it! I'll cut his throat if I have to. Josephine, no, this is not a good idea. This is good, Mother. Us women, us strong women, we will show the weak men of this world what we can do. Yes, I think I can even cut the throat of Jimmy if I need to. Although, he is dreamy. You see this knife, Mr. President Dictator? No, do not hurt me. Answer me one question and I will spare you. How did you learn of Mrs. Brooks' falsehood? The French consul, but what wrong? It was Monsieur Caron! Yes, we heard. Brigitte crosses to the telephone. Mother, what is Gregoire's number? It's in the address book, by the phone. Brigitte looks up the number and dials. Monsieur Caron, this is Brigitte, Mrs. Brooks' strong daughter. I need to see you immediately. Yes, send your car around for me. Let me go! Not a chance, weakling. Brigitte, what on earth? Shush! I'm in charge now. I'll wait outside for Gregoire's chauffeur. Strong woman of the world, unite! Lights out. Blackout. End of Act 2, Scene 1. Act 2, Scene 2. A short time later. Amy, I can hear you. Rocks, Amanda, Zane, Elliot, and Josephine are sitting in the living room. Yamiogo has passed out on the sofa on his stomach, one arm drooping to the floor. He is no longer tied up. His mouth is wide open as he snores loudly. Amanda stops near Yamiogo and peers down at him. He's shorter than I thought he would be. That's all you can think of now? We're all going to prison, Mother Dearest. Not me. I had nothing to do with this. No, nothing at all. You just threatened him with a knife and put a sleeping pill in his teeth. Why can't we just drop him off at Alcatraz? Because I'd have to come with you on the boat, dear, and you know I get seasick. On the bay? He's a cruel dictator. Elizabeth said so. I can earn points with her if we put him in prison. How many points do you need? Elizabeth has already agreed to let you touch her breasts. Only on the top of her dress. It's all your fault. If you hadn't lied about being an honorary consul for some tiny African country, we wouldn't be in this mess. I have an idea. The reception is just a day away. We will keep drugging the president and keep him on the sofa. And when our guests arrive, we'll tell them he has leprosy. I think you mean narcolepsy. That's a brilliant idea. And what do we do with him after the reception? He'll stay here as our guest, indefinitely. 
Josephine, you are a skilled cribbage player, and for that I am thankful. But you really can be... Dumb as a doorknob. Mrs. Brooke, your eldest child is awful to me. I think he's the devil's child. Well, yes, his father was a bit devilish the night he was conceived. <laughs> hey, you're right, Josephine. He has little horns coming out of his head. <laughs> Where's Brigida? She had business to take care of. Business? Brigida? Never mind. Now, listen. I will take care of this unfortunate situation in which we find ourselves, but I need your help. Zane, as soon as the president wakes up, you are to go to the front door and guard it. You can practice your poetry, but do it very quietly. Elliot, you block the kitchen door. We are not going to tie him up, but we are also not going to let him escape. Not until I convince him that this has been nothing more than an amusing and harmless interlude during his visit to San Francisco. Good luck with that. Oh, have some faith in me, Zane. All right. I'll go along with your plan on one condition. If we manage to escape prison, you promise to confess to all the consul court and stop pretending to be an honorary consul. Yes, mother, I agree with Zane. Ungrateful sons drive a ruthless bargain. What'll it be? All right, beastly boys. Promise. I promise. And what shall I do? Get the butcher knife from the kitchen and keep it handy. Josephine runs gleefully to the kitchen and returns immediately, brandishing the knife. <laughs> Is this a dagger which I see before me? He knows Macbeth. Brandishing Come. The knife, he approaches Zane slowly and menacingly. Thick night and pall thee in the dunnest smoke of hell, that my keen knife see not the wound it makes. Zane cries out and runs away from Josephine. Chicken! Cowardly devil's child, didst thou not rememberest your mother hadst me read the part of Lady Macbeth when thou didst read the play as a family? To your places, all of you. Elliot stands in front of the kitchen door. Zane moves to the foyer front door and Josephine hovers above Yamiogo, knife poised above his head. Yamiogo makes more sounds as he awakens and then falls off the couch. Silence. Is he? Is he dead? That would be most unfortunate. Amanda crosses to Yamiogo and feels his wrist. I believe I feel a pulse. Yamiogo suddenly grabs Amanda's wrist. She tries to pull herself up. He tries to pull himself up, but doesn't have the strength. As he sinks slowly to the ground, he pulls Amanda down with him. She straightens up as Yamiogo continues to hold on to her wrist. The two seesaw back and forth a few times. Finally, Amanda shakes loose of him, struggles to his feet, and staggers about like a drunk man. He giggles and runs toward Josephine. Startled, she drops the knife. He comes close to her and grins. Pretty lady. He giggles, then closes his eyes and purses his lips for a kiss, wobbling a bit. Josephine hesitates a beat and then purses her own lips, trying to place them on his lips but he's wobbling so much, he finally grabs him and plants a big kiss on him. Well, what'd you expect me to do? I can't remember the last time a man wanted to kiss me. The kiss brings Yamiogo to his senses. He is still a little dazed, but mostly alert. Did you just kiss me? <sighs> Why, yes, Mr. President. 
Please, Mr. President, have a seat. Uh, no. You have kept me captive, threatened me, and drugged me. I am going to the police immediately. He moves to the front door, but Zane blocks his way. Sorry, Mr. Yamiago. This is outrageous. He moves to the kitchen door, but Elliot blocks his way. Mrs. Brooke, I demand you release me. Josephine moves slowly toward Yamiogo, brandishing the knife. Did you just say, ooh, after I kissed you? Yamiogo, scared, backs away from her, falling back on the sofa. Josephine leans into his face. What will it be? My lips or my knife? That's enough now, Josephine. Josephine backs off but stays near. Yamiogo comes to a seated position on the sofa, glancing nervously at Josephine. Now then, President Yamiogo, this is all a most unfortunate misunderstanding, and I'm sure we can all merely roll along in no time at all. You will pay dearly. Really, Mr. President, you should know I can't control Josephine. So, let's just figure out together how we can make all parties happy without any bloodshed. Splendid. Oh my, <laughs> what kind of a hostess am I? Elliot, darling, go get a bottle of wine for our guest. How can I trust you won't drug me again? Elliot will open the bottle in front of you. Elliot exits the kitchen and returns with a bottle of wine, a bottle opener, and a wine glass. He opens the bottle, pours some into a glass, and hands it to Yamiogo. He sips, then guzzles. Elliot pours more into his glass. I think you forgot someone. Elliot goes into the kitchen and returns with a glass, pours wine into it, and hands it to Amanda. To our most important guest, whom we all sincerely hope will leave this house alive. She takes a sip. Elliot returns to his post outside the kitchen door. Mr. President, can I call you Maurice? Maurice, you must know something about me. I was raised in a very poor family in South San Francisco, not very far from this house. My father was a drunk, and my mother was very cold. I suffered greatly in my childhood, but when I met my husband, my life changed. I dedicated myself to my husband's career as a diplomat, charming kings and ruthless dictators, just like yourself, along the way. And as a mother, I gave all of my time and energy for my children. Oh, brother. And then, five years ago, my husband died. Widowhood is not easy, Maurice, particularly with three children. And being your honorary consul has been such an honor for me. And it's given me a taste of the life that I used to have with my dear, dear departed husband. This life brings me closer and my children closer to his sweet spirit. I do you no harm. Indeed, I bring your little country status. Surely you cannot deny me this one small pleasure in a life filled with grief. A beat as Yamiogo empties his glass of wine and holds it out for a refill. Amanda obliges. He sips as everyone looks on with hope. A couple more beats. I don't. What do you Americans say? Give a shit. Amanda sits next to him on the sofa, making sure her body is right next to his. She leans into him, obviously trying to seduce him. You are an attractive man, Maurice, and I am an attractive woman. Surely. Well, perhaps. Yes. We can 
arrange a, a kiss of passion? Amanda moves in closely to kiss him. Yamiogo shrinks into the sofa. <sighs> Here, let me pour you some more wine. She pours wine in his glass and tips it in his mouth. He coughs from the amount of fluid going into him. <clears throat> now kiss me. Amanda closes her eyes and puckers her lips. Yamiogo does the same. He tries to reach her lips but fails. Suddenly, Amanda switches gears and tickles him. <laughs> Yamiogo squirms and giggles. <laughs> oh, no, 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 stop. Elliot crosses to sofa, pulls off Yamiogo's shoes and socks, and tickles his feet. Amanda no! Tickles no! Feet. Stop! Amanda and Elliot stop tickling him. <sighs> My mother used to tickle me when I was a child. And? It brings back good memories. I'm so pleased. <laughs> And I will make sure you all go to prison. Uh, President Yamiogo, do you play cribbage? Yes. I'm the best player in all Upper Volta. Splendid. I am the best player in San Francisco, and I can beat you. You are but a woman. Well, then you'll be... Happy to prove your cribbage manhood. Of course. Good. We shall play one game. If you win, you will be free to call the authorities and have me arrested. If I win, you will not report us, and you will come to my reception for you tomorrow evening. I agree. Josephine, get the cribbage board and the playing cards. Josephine goes to a cupboard and brings the cribbage board and playing cards to Amanda. Amanda sets the cribbage board in front of Yamiogo on a table. She shuffles the cards. I deals first. Amanda picks a card from the deck and turns it over. Ha! Queen. Yamiogo picks a card from the deck and turns it over. King! <laughs> Monsieur le President, it is your crib. Deal the cards. Yamiogo takes the deck of cards from Amanda and shuffles them. He deals six cards to her and six cards to himself. Voila! Let's play cribbage. Lights out. Blackout. End of Act 2, Scene 2. Act 2, Scene 3. A short time later. At rise, Zane is still at the foyer front door. Elliot is still standing guard at the kitchen door. Josephine is still hovering somewhere with her knife and Amanda and Yamiogo are still at the cribbage board with cards in hand. Yamiogo puts his cards down and counts. 15-2, 15-4, 15-6, 15-8, and a pair is 10. <laughs> I win. <laughs> yes, Mr. President, you have won fair and square. Now you may use my telephone to call the authorities. Yes, I shall do so. But it is imperative that I gloat. <laughs> Disgusting dictator. Then gloat away. It was a pleasure to play with you, Miss Brooke. As a busy dictator, I, I mean president, I have no time to play cribbage and I miss it. You are skilled at the game. And I confess that I have missed being tickled. It would be quite undignified for me to be tickled since I am such a powerful man. Indeed. But when I was a child, I rather enjoyed it when my mother tickled me. You know, I was only eight years old when she died. Oh, you poor dear. I can tickle you some more if you'd like. <laughs> But you see, I cannot forgive you for the treatment you have subjected me to. Of course. And so, I shall call the authorities now and have you all arrested. Well, not me! <laughs> Mrs. Brooke forced me! 
to brandish this cruel knife. And I will make a public statement to the press, Mrs. Brooke, that though you are quite lovely, you are a fraud. That you were never my honorary counsel. Hey, Maurice, are you going to include me and my brother in this? Because we only did what our mother told us to do. Let me consider this. There is a loud knock on the front door. Zane answers it. Gregoire and Birgitta burst into the scene. Is he saying something? I can't understand him. I can't hear him. Me either. Wait a minute. Stop! President Yamayogo, you cannot send this lovely, innocent woman to a fate worse than death. Worse than death! If you do, you will regret it. You will regret it. You see, Monsieur le President, I have information. He has information! Rita, please shut up! I will shut up! I do not feel you. I do not care what so-called information you have. You have come to America to convince the government to give you aid, n'est-ce pas? Why would I want American aid? Because France will be withdrawing aid from you soon. Nonsense. <laughs> France has not forgiven you for your uh, independence two years ago. Then why has France continued to send us money? I have no idea. But I have heard from President Charles de Gaulle directly that he is cutting off all aid to you. How can I believe you? <laughs> because I have direct connection to President Charles de Gaulle and to Mr. And Mrs. Kennedy. Hmm? You? <laughs> Let me... <laughs> oh, Jacqueline Bouvier Kennedy and I were lovers in Paris in 1949. She would do anything for me. Amanda, please believe me, it meant nothing. Well, Jacqueline is quite beautiful. I wouldn't blame you if you were intimate with her. Was she good in bed? Not bad. I don't believe you. <laughs> Pas de problème. I will prove it to you. Gregoire crosses to the telephone and dials it. Uh, my dear President Kennedy, uh, I am here with, with President Yamayogo. Yamayogo crosses to the telephone and grabs the receiver from Gregoire. Mr. Kennedy. Is it true that you will give our humble country aid? When I saw you in Washington, D.C., you were non-committal. Thank you, Mr. President. But what are you saying? Only if I... Only if I don't report Mrs. Brooks to the authorities? But Mr. President, you, you must know that Mrs. Brooks is a liar and a kidnapper. Yes, yes, Mr. President. She is charming and... Uh, I will consider it. Mr. President, how can I forgive... And you expect me to turn up at her reception tomorrow? I don't think it. Mr. President, I will consider your offer. But I make no promises. Hello? Hello? President, Mr. President, Jack? He hung up on me. Oh, you just spoke on the telephone to the most powerful man in the world. Yes. Oh, Yamiogo, I, I think I love you. Will you share my bed with me? Oh. Uh, well, yes. think about it. Think about it. What will you do? Lights out. Blackout.
End of Act Two, Scene Three. Act Two, Scene Four, The Next Evening. At rise, Amanda is at the front door. The living room is strewn with empty champagne glasses and bottles, as well as some trays of hors d'oeuvres. Good night, President Yameogo. Je vous adore. Oh, good night, Herr Schmidt. Yes, of course, you can speak to the president about your infatuation with Hitchcock films. What, what is this Hitchcock? Oh, he's a darling movie director. Ask Herr Schmidt. She closes the front door and enters from the foyer. Oh, Gregoire, Josephine, I'm going upstairs to change into something more comfortable. Why, Monsieur Caron, you must sit on the sofa and rest your handsome feet. My handsome feet? Yes, your feet and your sexy body, your broad shoulders, your divine face, your strong legs. Josephine from behind massages his shoulders. Mmm, mmm, that feels good. Oh, I would give you this massage every night if you'd let me. Mmm. <laughs> Does this mean you'll marry me? What? You know, I, I will love you like nobody has ever loved a man. Hello. <gasps> Do not answer now. Think about it. She moves her hand from his shoulders to his neck and head, massaging them and mussing up his hair. <laughs> Ooh la la, c'est superbe. Oh, you are all the more irresistible now that I know you have been intimate with Mrs. Kennedy and such great friends with our president. Oh, well, in fact... Oh, do not tell me you and Jacqueline will run away together. I couldn't bear the heartache. No, I have never met Mrs. Kennedy. You lied? Oui. Well, that is great news. Now you can marry me, knowing there is no other woman in your heart. Uh, but Josephine, uh, Amanda is in my heart. I burn for her body and soul. You know that woman is a liar. Yes. The entire consular corps has known from the beginning that uh, she lied about being upper voters honorary consul. <laughs> we are not stupid. But why have you let her continue with this charade? She is so... Uh, Charmant, and we all adore her. Uh, only I adore her enough to want to marry her. Well, you must also know that she's lazy. She rarely rises from bed before noon, long after the children have gone to school. Yes, she has told me never to call on her before one in the afternoon. And how will you deal with her children? Hmm? Zane is the devil's child, Brigitte stupid, and Elliot is sex-crazed. Boarding school. Amanda is older than you. And you are older than she is. She will expect you to wait on her hand and foot. And I will do so with all my art. Josephine squeezes his shoulders tightly to hurt him. Ouch! Josephine stops massaging Gregoire. You will never again feel these magic hands on your body. Never, never, ever again. Never, ever, ever. Josephine, please bring us some champagne. Harlot. Amanda sits on the sofa next to Gregoire. Gregoire, darling, you're still here. I'm so pleased. You saved me from prison. And I would save you a thousand times more. You are so romantic. And yet perhaps inauthentic. Never. Never with, with you. No. 
Josephine enters with an open bottle of champagne and three glasses. She hands two of the glasses to Gregoire and Amanda and keeps one glass for herself. She pours champagne into her glass and downs it in one gulp. Gregoire and Amanda are holding out their glasses. You think I should pour this for you? She yes. fills the glass again and swigs it. Please, Josephine. Josephine slams the bottle of champagne on the table. Help yourself, Trollop. She exits to the kitchen with her champagne glass. Gregoire pours champagne into their glasses. Do your elf, my dear Amanda. It was a splendid reception, wasn't it, Gregoire? It was, uh, but the entire night, all I could think of was you. I couldn't take my eyes off of you. Gregoire, I know I have been aloof with you, as I have been with my children, and I am not proud of it. I know you think of me as a dilettante, and you are right, but I know something of human nature. Uh, you put up a good fight, but deep down, there is a art full of love. If not for me, then for your children. For my children and for you. You have won my heart, Gregoire. Gregoire gets down on one knee and pulls the diamond ring box from his pocket and opens it. Tell me now, Amanda, that you will marry me. I told you before, this diamond is way too small. I need at least one carat. And rubies are emeralds embedded in the band. This I will do. Now will you marry me? Mm, I suppose so. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> you have made me the happiest man in the world. He kisses her passionately. Mm. That was quite a nice French kiss. Bah non, that was not a French kiss. For a French kiss, we need tongues. Uh... Let's save that for our wedding night, shall we? <laughs> um, in the meantime, I must make it clear to you that I will marry you on one condition only. I will not send my children to boarding school. I agree. Reluctantly. Good. Let's meet tomorrow. We'll discuss the wedding arrangements. I'm expecting a honeymoon in Paris at the Hotel Le Royal Monceau. Oh, Cherie, you know that is the most expensive hotel in all of Paris. Of course. Anything for you. And you will have to give me frequent foot massages. How could I deprive you? And regular supplies of champagne and caviar. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. You may leave now. Oh. Al grabs Amanda's hand and kisses it, moving his lips up her arm. <laughs> Why is it enough, dear Gregoire? Now go. I shall not sleep a wink tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Neither shall I. A demain, Charlie. He exits through foyer front door. Zane, Brigitte, and Elliot enter from the stairs. Oh, they're finally gone. <sighs> yes, darlings, but what a grand party it was. And now you'll confess your lies to the entire consul court. In good time. What does that mean? When will we get to see you in the evenings, or maybe occasionally for breakfast? Breakfast? What is that? She won't do it, even though she promised. Yes, I will. President Yamayogo is a dictator, and I cannot, in all good conscience, continue to work for him. Well, you don't actually work for him, but you're doing the right thing. However, I have some news that puts a new light on all the demands that you're making. Wait, 
I have some news too. I've been accepted to Berkeley. <gasps> that is good oh, news. Oh. I didn't think it was possible. And I've been offered a partial football scholarship. Oh, congratulations, my eldest. I'm so proud of you. And as a Cal alumnus, your father would have been doubly proud. Thank you. And I'm going to continue to live at home so you can save money, mother. Oh, that's not necessary. What? Really, it's not necessary. I think I'll major in English literature. I see my future as a poet, maybe a beat poet. Ugh, beat poetry is so passe, dear. Well, I'll work hard. No distractions. No more Sally, no more women. Just try not to substitute men for women. Mother. <laughs> Just a little joke, darling. I have some news too. Oh, you just bought a new bra? Zane will be happy. You will eat your words, little brother, when you see how smart your sister is. Do tell. You know how Gregoire saved you from prison? Yes, bless him. Well, all that stuff he said, that was my idea. You mean the stuff, as you so indelicately put it, about the American A to Upper Volta? Yes, we made that all up. Gregoire has no connections in Washington, and he has never met the Kennedys. But that phone call he made... Also my idea. He has a friend here in San Francisco, an actor, who can do a wonderful Kennedy impersonation. So, Gregoire and you arranged to call him? Exactly. Absolutely brilliant. Bravo, darling. <laughs> President Yamiago is going to be mad when he finds out it was a ruse. Don't worry. Gregoire assures me that the French will continue to fund Upper Volta generously for a while. Yeah, and who would believe President Yamioga that we kidnapped him, particular, particularly since he came to the reception all smiles? It's good thinking, sis. And Gregoire assures me that in the near future, France will get tired of financially supporting an ex-colony and Yamioga will be overthrown. As he should be. Though I must say, he's quite a brilliant cribbage player. What was your news, mother? I have agreed to marry Gregoire. <laughs> what? Well, you know, if for no other reason than to have sex, it has been five long years. Ugh. He is a good man, and he absolutely adores me. And I... I love him. I approve. I'm so happy that you approve. <laughs> of course. Don't worry, we're not gonna, I'm not going to leave. Is he gonna move in here? He's leaving. This means we'll see any more of you than we do now. You'll still be going out every night to some dumb party. That's right. I take back my approval. You two baby boys. What the? You can't live without your mommy. You want to curl up in her lap like little two-year-olds? Just like you crawled into her bed after dad died. For months! Well, dear, I don't know that it was months. Zane, you're going to be busy in college and you'll hardly ever be home. And you, Elliot, you'll be spending the next few years chasing after girls. Even if Mother was home every night, you'd be occupied with schoolwork or looking at girly magazines. But mothers are supposed to be home with their kids. Our mother is not like most mothers. She can't cook, she doesn't bake cookies, she thinks the PTA is a joke, and we never see her at the breakfast table. But you know what? She's fun. We get to read Shakespeare with her, she plays cribbage with us, even though she cheats occasionally and always wins. She doesn't care if we stay up late at night. She lets us drink champagne on special occasions. There's nothing we can't tell her. She doesn't judge us. She's completely crazy, but fun. Perhaps crazy is a bit of an overstatement. And you know what else? She's strong. Not like you little weakling boys. After Dad died, she helped us through the rough times. I'll bet you never heard her cry at night for months after Dad died. She didn't want you to see how sad she was. That takes strength. Brigitte fills a glass with champagne and swigs it. 
Women like mother and me, we don't need little whiny boys in our lives. I don't need pepperoni face Jimmy, and mother doesn't need Gregoire. But she deserves him, and they're in love. And if she wants to go out to stupid parties every night, so what? Wow. Can I take some of your bras with me to Berkeley? I might give them all to you. Why should I bind my breasts up? Maybe I should let my breasts go free. Is this really my sister? It appears so. She's blossomed into an independent and intelligent young woman. Thanks to you, Mother. I am woman! Hear me roar! Roar! I am woman, hear me roar. You know that might make a rather intriguing song title. All right, Mother. I give you my blessing. Go ahead and marry Gregoire. I guess I can practice my French with him. But you know he will never take the place of Dad. Oh, of course not, dear. Good boys. Now go upstairs and study. No, wait. Um, I want one of you to stay and play cribbage with me. Ah, uh, sorry. I have to practice for my poetry recital. I need to go to Jimmy's house and throw his stupid ring in his ugly face. I have to go call Elizabeth and find out when she wants me to... What? Zane and Elliot move toward the staircase exit. Brigitte to the foyer front door exit. Sorry, Mother. A exit. Josephine! What do you want? Jezebel. I want to play cribbage. Josephine hesitates, then goes to cupboard and takes out the cribbage board and playing cards. She sits across from Amanda and shuffles the cards. If I win, Gregor is mine. <laughs> Not a chance. Lights fade. Blackout. End of play. <laughs>